And whenever I start thinking about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out. One Bible writer put it like this, Because your love and kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. He was just grateful for who God was and what God was doing. Isn't it amazing, tragically amazing, how we reserve our best compliments, our most fervent encouragement and affirmation for someone, we reserve that until they're laying in a casket in a room filled with flowers. And regarding flowers, do you know that statistics show that more money is spent on flowers for funerals than for Valentine's Day or for Mother's Day or for any other holiday in the year? That tells me that if we're not careful, our feelings of regret can be more powerful than our feelings of gratitude. But regarding gratitude, think about this with me. If you are persistent with something, you're going to get it. If you're consistent with something, you're going to keep it. But if you're grateful and if you have a heart of gratitude you're going to attract more of it. And that's why here today, I've come just filled with gratitude, thankful for all that God is, thankful for all that God is doing. Again, do we have any thankful people, any grateful people in the house here today? I'm so grateful for a number of things. I'm grateful that I get to be at CLC here today with the 10 o'clock crowd. And no one really prepared me for how good looking the 10 o'clock crowd really is. I mean, someone said something in passing, and I'm like, well, I'm sure they're nice people, but y'all showed up and showed out here today. And I'm grateful for that. I'm so grateful for Pastor Jerry and Pastor Chris, Pastor John, all the team that makes this church such a unique and incredible place. Guys, can I just remind you that the grass is not greener anywhere else and that you are a part of something wonderful and that God is up to some amazing things. As Pastor Jerry mentioned, he's been like a father to me, and, and I just want to just give him honor all the way across the ocean. I want to give them honor today. I know that you have a lot of guest speakers that come through here and talk about how much they love the McQuays and how they appreciate the McQuays, but you can mark this down. No one loves them more or appreciates them more than I do. It doesn't get any better than this. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I'm also grateful for a church that has the audacity and that has the courage to tackle what is my favorite thing <laughs> and my favorite subject to talk about. If you're just joining us here today, for the last couple of weeks... Our church has been going through the Song of Solomon. And the Song of Solomon is an incredible, an incredible book. You don't hear it talked about much in churches. It's one of those books that we try to pretend like isn't really in the Bible and shouldn't be there because it's all about sex. And... Today, we're going we're gonna to unpack this. And I just want to give a very clear disclaimer to all the parents. If you have a child in here or a teenager that you have not yet had the talk with, now would be a good time to get up and to excuse yourself and involve them in kids' ministry. I could not handle this being on my conscience that this white boy from Ohio was the one that introduced your child to the birds and the bees. So please, please go now because the, the Song of Solomon is amazing. So I, I grew up in church and 
my father was a pastor. And I can remember about the age of, of 12 or 13, I was looking in my, my father's library. He had all kinds of books. And I found this book entitled Solomon on Sex. So I'm like 12 or 13, so that, that was like, you know, gold. So I grabbed that thing, started looking through it, and was blown away. So I went ahead and snuck that thing out of my dad's office, took it to my bedroom. I had it shoved between the box springs and the mattress. I was looking that, at that thing as much as I possibly could. I'd wait until my parents would go to bed at night. All the lights were out. I'd get up under the covers with that book, slide it out from under the bed with a flashlight, be reading through all of that. Friends at school would be like, hey, Jason, hey, come check this out. We found some of our dad's playboys. I'm like, no thanks. I've got the Song of Solomon. I don't need anything else. That was like gold in the hands of a 12 or a 13-year-old, and it's still gold. And I want to direct your attention today to what has been our foundational passage, the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs, chapter number 1. And verse number 1, it says this. This is Solomon's Song of Songs. More wonderful than any other. Kiss me and kiss me again, for your love is sweeter than wine. How pleasing, how pleasing is your fragrance. Your name is like the spreading fragrance of scented oils. No wonder all the young women love you. And at this point, verses 1 through 3, it's just like a regular old love song. We're just, you know, talking about holding hands and kissing and I like to be with you and you know, let's go on a date. Let's get some cotton candy. But when you get to verse number four, there is a substantial shift. And my man Solomon's like, we're getting ready to go in. And verse number four, take me with you. Come, let's run. The king has brought me into his bedroom. Bound, chicka, bound, wow. This is a love song that leads to sex. And listen, this, this series could not be more appropriately named. I love the fact that it's called Love Song because music so perfectly helps with all things love, sex, and romance. And I know this from, from personal experience. You see, back in the day, back when there was a thing called cassette tapes, and if you're sitting by anyone that's under the age of 35, you might need to nudge them and take a moment and explain to them what a cassette tape is. But, but back in the day, I used to make the most unbelievable mixtapes that you've ever heard in your life. You remember back in the day when you had the boom box or the stereo with the side-by-side -side tape deck? And you'd put that blank cassette in there and turn it to your favorite radio station. And you'd listen all day long for the song that you'd want to come on. And as soon as it would come on, you'd have to run to that stereo. And God forbid you're doing dishes or mowing the grass because you just have to leave it and get there or you'd have to wait all day. You'd run up on that stereo, push that play and record button at the same time, record that song, and then when it's over, hit stop and wait for the next song to come on. That was a mixtape. And listen, I used to make the most amazing romantic mixtapes. But it wasn't for girlfriends, and it wasn't for fiancés, and it wasn't for wives. I would make a mixtape just to get a girl to go out on a date with me. Like when, when you're working with as limited things as I am, you will use whatever means are available to help you out with the opposite sex. 
And my thinking was, there is no way in the world that a girl can say no to a mixtape that has All My Life by KC and JoJo and Always Be My Baby by Mariah Carey. Come on, somebody. It worked like this. I'd get that mixtape together and I'd, I'd, I'd walk up to her, hey girl, I made something for you, but first, what's your name? Mine's Jason. <laughs> Bam, here's a mixtape. Want to go to Wendy's? And thank God for music because it helped me get some dates when I needed to. And it's very obvious that, that Solomon understood the power of music and, and understood the effect that music has on, on romance and on sex. I mean, Solomon, when you read through this song of song, this man, and I want to be generationally appropriate for everyone that's here today, Solomon is the Marvin Gaye of the Bible. Solomon is the Trey Songs of the Old Testament. Solomon is the Drake of the Bible. Kiki, do you love me? Are you riding? Say you'll never ever leave from beside me. Solomon knows what he's talking about. And as you can see, And as you can see what happens in these first four verses, it starts off as a love song, but then it shifts in these first four verses eventually on bended knee. And how many boys to men fans do we have in the house here today? Eventually on bended knee turns into I'll make love to you. And this shouldn't make us one bit uncomfortable. This is all God's design. I want you to think about this with me. Once upon a time, there was no such thing as sex. And then one day, all of a sudden, God had this absolutely incredible idea. And God thought it up. Our great, glorious, amazing God, bam, one day just invented sex. And can I tell you that when I get to heaven, I'm going to be the first in line to fist bump, fist bump God and to thank Him for this gift that He has given to the world. You fast forward to today, and whenever you bring up the subject of sex, you, you realize very quickly that there are three potential ways in which we can all view sex. The first is that sex is a God, that sex is a God, and this is the way that the world views it. They have exalted sex to the highest place, and they have made it the ultimate pursuit, and they have made it the most lofty ideal. You see this in movies, you see this in commercials, in the rise of dating apps like Tinder. Sex is a God, particularly in the United States of America, but really all around the world. Sex is a God. The world worships it. And you're thinking, how is that even possible? But watch this. Romans 12 and verse number 1 teaches us that what we do with our bodies is worship. So they've made a God... Out of sex. They've made a God out of it by doing it their way, by ignoring or disobeying God's way. So that's one particular perspective that sex is God. The other extreme is that sex is gross. And unfortunately, this is the way that the church historically has handled this incredible thing that God gave us. 
I was born and raised in church. My father was a pastor, and I've seen it. The church is awkward about sex. The church does not talk about it whatsoever. It has taught people to have weird feelings and ideas about it. And the church, because we communicate often with what we say and with you know, nonverbal things. We, we communicate that sex is gross, so we're made to feel bad or embarrassed about it. So there is sex as God, and sex is gross. And can I just inform you today that neither of these extremes, neither of these extremes are appropriate. They're both in error. The true, right, healthy, biblical view of sex is that sex is a gift. And that's the title of my message here today, The Gift of Sex. Sex is a gift. It is beautiful. It is good. It makes babies. And it's fun. This is something that God created. And that's why that the church cannot be silent any longer. The church cannot keep our mouths closed about it anymore. We can't be awkward about it anymore. When I was growing up, all I ever heard was no, no, no in regards to sex. Don't do it. 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 And if you get married, just do it if you have to. But the reality of the matter is that sex is our message. God created it. Sex is our message. The church should be the one. And I know this is going to upset all of the, all of the religious people and all of the haters who are even right now thinking, I can't believe they're talking about this in church. This is so not appropriate. Listen, sex is our message. Sex is for believers. It is Satan and the world that has taken our message and is holding it hostage. The church should be the one talking about it and teaching about it and celebrating it and encouraging it. It was our God that made it. It wasn't Satan. It was God. And the world has taken it and has taken our message hostage and then they've made our gift, this gift of sex. The world has, has turned it and they've made it something less, something broken, Something inferior, something complicated, something that is unfulfilling, all the while deceiving us into thinking that God's plan is what's wrong. And that if you're a part of the church and you decide to be a believer, then you're just going to have to basically sterilize your romantic life and just live out the rest of your life bored and disinterested in sex. But sex is a gift from God. So we've been going through the Song of Solomon these last couple of weeks and, and we've been looking at dating through God's lens. We've been looking at getting married through God's lens. But now let's see how God feels about sex. I want to pick up where we left off last week. Song of Solomon chapter 3 and verse number 5. The Bible says this. You've been going verse by verse. It says this. Promise me, O women of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and wild deer, not to awaken love until the time is right. And this is an echo of a sentiment that we have heard repeated in the first couple of chapters. Wait until the time is right. Over and over again, we hear this message. What is the point? What is really being said here? It leads me to the first thing that I want to share with you here today. Sex is both wonderful and powerful. Sex is both wonderful and powerful. Since God is our heavenly Father who loves us and wants the best for us, and He created this gift for us, don't you think that He knows what's best? Don't you think that the creator of something is most qualified to write the best operator's manual. So as we're thinking about the gift of sex, what would you expect God to say about it? 
that sex is both wonderful and powerful. The wonderful part makes it worth pursuing, but the powerful part makes it worth respecting. In other words, and this is going to really blow your mind, God is wanting you to have amazing sex. He is rooting for you to have and enjoy frequent, mind-blowing sex. Hashtag the best sex ever. (laughs) That is what God is wanting for all of you. So what he's done, he has imparted wisdom and safeguards so that it can be as wonderful as he created it to be and so that the power of it does not hurt or damage us, his children, in any way. And this is hard for you to wrap your brain around. I understand because we think that it's Oprah and Cosmo magazine. We think that it's Dr. Ruth or Playboy who are the biggest advocates for our sexuality. But hear me today, don't do it their way. You really want the best sex ever? They don't know what they're talking about. Don't embrace their wisdom. Don't model their methodologies. God's way is not just right, it's better. Our sexual practices, if we're really wanting amazing, mind-blowing sex, our sexual practices should be God-honoring. They should be in alignment with the one who created it, with the one that wrote the operator's manual. God's way is the best way. Sex is both wonderful and powerful. Song of Solomon chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 She says, the woman is writing here. One night as I lay in bed, I yearned for my lover. I yearned for him, but he did not come. So I said to myself, I will get up and roam the city, searching in all its streets and squares. I will search for the one I love. So I searched everywhere, but did not find him. The watchmen stopped me as they made their rounds, and I asked, Have you seen the one that I love? And then scarcely had I left them when I found my love. I caught and I held him tightly. And then I brought him to my mother's house into my mother's bed. She's a super freak. She's super freaky. I brought him to my mother's house into my mother's bed where I had been conceived. What is the scripture teaching us here? And ladies, I'd like to talk to you just for a moment. God honoring sex should not be dutiful or obligatory. Notice that the wife The woman in this narrative, she is the one that went after him. She initiated the whole thing. She's sitting around the house. She gets thinking about her man. And she's like, I want me some of that. And I want it now. I'm going after it. She was the initiator. And I like that. The initiator. It kind of sounds like a Denzel Washington movie. I am the initiator. But she was the initiator. Notice this was not something on just her checklist. It's not like go to Walmart, check. Pick up Susie from ballet practice, check. Walk the dog, check. Have sex with my husband, check. This was not a matter of this just being on on a checklist or she didn't have this this kind of have-to attitude like, well, I've got to do this because we scheduled it two months ago. (laughs) She's got passion. She's going after it. She wants it. And this teaches us that God is wanting sex to be passionate. 
He's wanting it to be adventurous. He's wanting it to be spontaneous. Now, when I think of dutiful and obligatory, I'm not thinking passionate, adventurous, spontaneous. We're talking about two totally different values here. God is wanting sex to be adventurous, spontaneous, fun. He's wanting it to be a priority. And I'll tell you, God even wants sex to be a little freaky. It was the wife who was aggressive. She wasn't feeling bad about wanting her husband. She wasn't all repressed and, and puritanistic thinking, oh my, what would grandma think if she knew what I was doing right now? She went after him. She went after him. And ladies, listen to me. I cannot emphasize enough the positive effect that this has on your husbands. Ladies, I cannot tell you how important it is to forget about duty and obligation and open yourself up to be passionate and aggressive. How it makes him feel wanted. How it makes him feel desirable. Ladies, listen to me. Your man, your husband, he wants you to want him. Not just respond out of duty. Listen, if you've got a good man, if you've got a husband all week long, he is out there. He is being a savage in the boardroom. He is being a soldier on the assembly line. He's out there hustling. He's out there making it happen. He is pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. When he comes home, it would be really nice for the woman that he forsook all other women for, the only woman that he can see naked, the only woman that he can entertain sexual thoughts about. It's very helpful that after he has poured out that she's there to pour into him. There's a, an amazing book on relationships called The Five Love Languages that basically teaches that there are five ways that we show and receive love. And those five love languages are physical touch, words of affirmation, gifts, quality time, and acts of service. And we have a primary and we have a secondary. But, but, but listen, you don't even need to, to read the book when it comes to your husband. Just take it from me. I, my love language, my primary is touch. And my secondary is touch me some more. God honoring sex is not dutiful or obligatory. Hear me today. Dutiful and obligatory is wearing those old sweats covered with dried paint all day. Dutiful and obligatory is when night falls going through that same routine of lights out, shirt on, staring at the ceiling. God has more in mind for our marriages. God has more in mind for your sex life. Come on, ladies, switch it up every now and then. Wear some makeup. And whatever you do, don't keep Victoria a secret. No matter your body type and no matter how you look, I get it. You might feel a little insecure. You're not happy with this, that, and the other. You, you feel a little awkward because you've kept some baby weight. Whatever the case may be, hear me. You look better in satin or lace than you do in flannel every single time. This woman wanted her man. There was something that was awoken her, a drive, a desire. So the million dollar question is what made her feel that way? What made her want to be that way? So I did a little research. I want to find the answer. The dating site eHarmony, it made a list of the top 10 things that women find sexy. So that had my attention, so I started going through the list. That a man has talent, 
He's a listener, kind, smart, great smile, funny, has confidence, makes eye contact, no drama, and voice, his voice. And man, I was all bummed out. I'm like, man, one for 10. That's all I've got going for me, one for 10. And then I looked again and I'm like, Oh, it doesn't say looks funny. It says be funny. All right, 0 for 10. 0 for 10. But the Bible even here in the Song of Solomon reveals, guys, what, what awoke that in her, what put that kind of passion in her. Song of Solomon 3 and verse number 6 says, Who is this sweeping in from the wilderness like a cloud of smoke? Who is it? fragrant with myrrh and frankincense. And when you read throughout the entire book, there's all this care and, and deliberate writing given to smells. It says, who is this fragrant with myrrh and frankincense and every kind of spice? You know what, guys, woke this passion up in his woman? He smelled good. He smelled good. Hey, bro, brush your teeth. I'm just here to help you. Don't be mad at me. I'm your friend. Wash your feet. It's called cologne and deodorant. Use some. He smelled good. Nothing's going to kill amorous feelings in your woman than when you roll in there smelling like the eight cups of coffee that you drank that morning and that Philly cheesesteak with extra grilled onions that you ate for lunch. He smelled good, but then there was something else. Song of Songs 3, verse number 7. She says, look, it's Solomon's carriage surrounded by 60 heroic men, the best of Israel's soldiers. What is this talking about? He's, he's showing up. He's wearing his work uniform. He's with the team from the job. He is living out his purpose. Man, that really turned her on. The fact that her man was living out his purpose. That he had gotten up that morning and decided that he was going to be a contributor. That he was going to be a conqueror. That he was going to be a cultivator that he was going to make things happen, that he was going to provide for his family. Nothing, listen to me guys, nothing is sexy about a guy that is sitting on the couch all day playing video games. I know you want to get to that next level in Fortnite, but if you want a woman and if you want amazing sex, you need to get up and go get yourself a job. Because there is something about a man that comes home from working all day, providing for his family. Man, it unleashed something in her. She's like, look at my man. Look at that uniform. Mm -mm, look at the king. Woo. Song of Solomon chapter 4. It's going to get really interesting now. Song of Solomon 4, verse number 1. They're together. It's getting ready to happen. He's looking her up and down. He just kind of starts at the top. You're beautiful, my darling. Beautiful beyond words. I hear a nice little beat going, a little saxophone playing in the background. <laughs> little Chris Brown playing. Little Privacy by Chris Brown playing. You're beautiful, my darling, beautiful beyond words. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair falls in waves. And you'll have to pardon some of the allegories. They're rather strange and not appropriate. These lines won't work. But your hair falls in waves like a flock of goats. <laughs> your teeth are as white as sheep, not yellow as corn. Your teeth are as white as sheep. And your smile is flawless. Your smile is flawless. Each tooth matched with its twin. You know what he's saying? Girl, you got a mouthful of teeth and I like it. And that's how we know that she neither played hockey or was from the state of Arkansas. <laughs> he says, girl, you got all your teeth. 
Your lips are like scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is inviting. Your cheeks are like rosy pomegranates. Your neck is as beautiful as the Tower of David. He's just working his way down. Cover your eyes, folks. Your breasts are like two young deer just... <laughs> just bouncing around in the forest. And before the dawn breezes blow and the night shadows flee, I'm going to hurry to the mountain and, and he just goes down through. I don't want to read all of it because it's going to take too much time. But, but what is going on here? Here's the next thing that I want to leave with you. Listen to me, guys. God honoring sex is filled with knowledge. It's filled with knowledge. Listen, this man... Started from the top, started working his way down. He knew her body better than she did. He knew how it worked. He knew all about it. He had, he had done his research, had explored. He knew exactly where everything was, what it was supposed to do. He wasn't going off a bunch of locker room banner. He wasn't running in a bunch of myths and assumptions that he learned from his friends. He wasn't getting ready to act based off a bunch of stuff that he saw on movies or stuff that he's seen in pornography. It's obvious to me that he wasn't too proud to ask questions like, I'm just going to do my thing and you're just going to like it. No, he had knowledge. He knew her body better than she did. And it reminds me of the greatest advice that my dad ever gave to me. My dad was my pastor, my father, my best friend. One day, I'm in my early teen years. We're riding down the road, and my dad all of a sudden looks over to me and says, Jason, what do you think is your most powerful sexual organ? And I'm like, turning red. Are you kidding me, dad? Like, are you seriously going to make me answer that question? Like, that's obvious. He says, no, son, really. What do you think is the most powerful sex organ that you have? I'm like, dad, really, bro? Like, you're going to make, this is embarrassing. Like, you're going to really make me say this? Like, you're a guy, I'm a guy. We both know the answer to that question. He said, son, it's not what you think it is. He said, the most powerful sexual organ you have is your brain. And he said, the more you know, the better lover you'll be. Because God-honoring sex is filled with knowledge. Guys, listen, have knowledge. Take the time to learn her body and to know how it works. Go out and get you some, some medical books if you have to. But, but learn how it operates. Ask her questions. Be open to learn. Express affirmation to her. Don't go up and say, Hey, baby, you want some of this? Try saying, girl, you look so fly today. Man, I can't, I can't wait to be with you later. I'm so thankful for you. Man, you look so beautiful. Express affirmation and pursue the right approach. The right approach. Husbands, you are not sexy when you hop out of the shower and dance naked. That's doing nothing for her. In fact, mind-blowing sex starts long before the bedroom. It starts when you're vacuuming and when you're doing dishes and when you're mowing the grass. Preferably all three of those things with your clothes on. When you help with the kids when you're doing your daily Bible reading, when you're rounding up the family and taking them to church, God-honoring sex is filled with knowledge. Chapter 4 and verse number 9, it says, You've captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. Listen, listen to, that, to that rhetoric. You've captured my heart. You've hold it, you held, hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes, with a single jewel of your necklace. Your love delights me, my treasure. Your love is better than wine. Your perfume more fragrant than spices. Your lips are as sweet as nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. They are French kissing thousands of years before France is even a nation. Isn't our God good? 
Your clothes are scented like the cedars of Lebanon. And notice again, you are my private garden. My treasure, my bride, a secluded spring. So they're at this point, they're looking at intimate areas. They're thinking about intimate acts. And what is being communicated here is you have captured my heart. And all this, and all this, it is a, a private garden. It is a secluded spring. It is a hidden fountain. In other words, and this is the next point that I want to leave with you, God honoring sex is marked by exclusivity. God honoring sex is marked by exclusivity. In regards to these intimate areas and these intimate acts, there is limited exclusive access. It is not being handled by everyone. Others are not being brought into it. And I think I need to say to the church in the 21st century that swinging is not a part of God's plan for us to have mind-blowing, amazing sex. Pornography. This, this is, a, this is a, a secret garden. This is a private thing. Pornography is not a part of it. Listen, I know that conventional wisdom, the world teaches you that if you bring pornography into your marriage, if you bring pornography into your sex life, it will spice it up. It's a lie. It will work to destroy it. You will not have the mind-blowing, amazing sex that God has promised to you when you bring pornography into the picture. Why? Because you are virtually bringing other people into the secret garden. You are bringing people into that limited, exclusive place of access. And when ex exclusivity is lacking, it diminishes your personal value and the value of the act. And now get ready. I've saved the best for last. Song of Songs, chapter 4 and verse number 13. <laughs> your thighs... Shelter of paradise. You are a garden fountain, a well of fresh water streaming down. Awake, north wind. <laughs> Rise up, south wind. Blow on my garden and spread its fragrance all around. Come into your garden, my love, and taste its finest fruits. Ladies and gentlemen, that is in the Bible. And I am not even going to explain to you what this means because I promised Pastor Jerry that I would not give any commentary to this whatsoever. But it is extremely extremely graphic concerning what this couple was doing together. So what this does, this leads Christians into asking questions like, good point, Pastor, what exactly are we allowed to do sexually? Like what's considered sinful? What's considering, considered God-honoring? Are, are there anything off limits? Is there anything that that God's not down with. It, it, is it possible to go too far? And this is the last point that I want to leave with you. God smiles on all sexual acts as long as she allows it, is comfortable with it, and does not feel cheapened by it. The woman is always the judge concerning what is sexually permissible. The Bible says that the marriage bed is undefiled. That tells me that God smiles on all sexual acts. So it's not even about what does God allow or what is God cool with. The woman is ultimately the judge. She's the referee as to what is okay and what is not okay. So how do we wrap up a message like this? 
I think the book of James gives us the best guidance. He says, don't go and just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. Another wise man says, whatever your hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. But seriously, though, as we've been spending time together here today, as you've heard the word, as you've sat in the holy presence of this amazing God, most likely you, you've, you've started to realize that you've let the world's culture, you've let, you've let the world's thinking, you've let the world's perspectives shape your thoughts, shape your feelings, shape your actions, not just sexually, but in all areas of life. And that's why it's time for a fresh start. God loves you. God has incredible things for you. His best can only be realized by aligning with Him, surrendering to Jesus Christ, making Jesus Christ the Lord and the leader of your life. It's time for a fresh start. It's time to surrender to Jesus and let Him start shaping and remodeling and transforming you, not just sexually, but in every part of your life. Romans 12, 2 says this, don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I want to pray for you here today. Every head bowed and every eye closed all over this building and particularly I, I want you to hear me today if you are not yet a believer or you were at one time a believer but you realize now that you're just you're not right with God you're far from where you need to be I want you to I want you to pray with an open heart right now a heart of surrender Father I thank you I thank you for each and every one of these people I thank you for the truth of your word I thank you for the promise that is there. So much hope. There's so much, so much good that you have for our life in every single area. Lord, I come against the lie from Satan that says, if you become a Christian, that you can't have fun, that you can't enjoy the better things that life has to offer. No, every good and perfect gift, Lord, is from you. Help us to see that not only does it all start with you, but you're the one that knows best. I pray today, Lord, as we open our hearts and our lives, that you would rush in and that you would replace our sin with your righteousness. That you would replace our corrupt ideas with your holy ideals. And I just pray today that you would make us a new person. Forgive us, clean us, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to live the elevated life. We thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Come on, can we clap our hands and thank Jesus today?